I'm Jerry O'Dell. And I'm from uh, Schuylkill Township. And if you don't, we're just right down the road. We're the township between the borough of, come on, the borough of Potts, uh, uh, Phoenixville and Valley Forge Park. And what we're going to talk about today, we, I, I'm on the EAC there, and we did, uh, we did a wetland restoration back in uh, uh, last spring. And when I, when I, was, uh, when I was working on this uh, proposal, they, they were saying that uh, you try to get, uh, uh, when you're, for your session title, do something that's obviously compelling, it explains the, uh, uh, the topic, but you want it to be catchy or whatever. And I thought last, uh, back last year, and when we were working, it was nothing but mud, and, and it's, it was really true. It was a no-brainer for me. We were muddy, we were dirty, and we really had a lot of fun doing it. So that was the uh, name of our talk, uh, Getting Dirty and Having Fun. And uh, what we, uh, the, let me talk, what I want to do is talk to you a little bit about the site. It's, uh, uh, in, it's called Valley Park. It's in uh, the, the township purchased it as open space back in 2009. And I'm going to walk you through, we're going to do the day-by-day -day establishment of the, the wetland. There's also a little stream restoration involved with it and uh, a meadow, uh, a little lowland meadow restoration also. And then I'll, I'll talk about that. I have, um, I have some pictures that, that uh, take it through the, uh, the summer and see how it progressed. And I think it's really, it, it became, it's really... Uh, uh, the beginning of uh, a real vibrant ecosystem. So do that. We have some lessons learned. Uh, we talk about that. And I'm going to turn it over to Drew. And then Drew is going to talk a little bit about the grant funding that we use for this project and also what might, what might be available for, uh, for other similar projects. So um, again, I said the, uh, the, the site is roughly it's just under 16 acres. And we purchased it in 2009 as open space. The residential development right across the street, for some reason, this was before I got involved. Uh, I was uh, involved with the EAC. And he had a problem, the developer had a problem with their uh, wetland mitigation. And so the township worked something out with him so he could, and, and what we did, and it really made more sense to do a wetland at this area. So that's what they did. They, they worked something out, and this is what, uh, 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 this is basically what the project is and, and what the site, what, what started it all. The site itself, it really, uh, I mean, it's really from an environmental standpoint, it's a, it's a real gem, it's a treasure. It has, uh, there's a, an upland forest, Trust me, it, it's loaded with invasives. There's invasives all over, but it does have an upland forest, which is primarily red oak, and there's white oak, uh, there's some beech, there's a lot of hickory, smaller hickory. There's a lowland forest, and it, which primarily red maple. It has some uh, sycamore, some pin oak, a lot of spice bush everywhere. A lot of invasives, as you can see. And there's also two little streams that are running through the, the property. And, and they converge right around the area where we're going to be doing the wetland and building the wetland. So that's part of this, this whole project to do uh, restore this uh, little stream. The site also has, I mean, it really is a microcosm of the history of our, of our township, both natural and man-made. It was, at one time, it was the Colonel Anderson it was his farm, and he was, uh, he was a colonel in the uh, militia, Pennsylvania militia during the Revolution. And he was involved with uh, George Washington during, during the encampment. And this, is, this was his property, and this is where his family was buried. And the township has been uh, maintaining this and taking care of this for a number of years. It also has, it was at one time, was a, uh, it was a trolley park about 100 years ago about uh, 1910 to about 1920 or so, the, it was the Valley, Valley Park. And it was a little amusement park. You could uh, bring your family, you'd take the trolley, come in there. There was a Ferris wheel. There was a pond where they, uh, good, uh, people would go swimming. 
and the pond, the area where we're going to be working on uh, the, the wetland and the meadow was at one time the pond. And it failed a number of years ago. And in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, maybe even longer, it's just an undulating mass of Phragmites. So, uh, but these trolley parks, they were kind of all over. I think uh, Pottstown, I think we had Ringing Rocks. There was one in Sanatoga. Uh, Willow Grove, I think, started as a, uh, as a trolley park, and this was one of them. So, so anyhow, um, that's, that was the, uh, that's the site, uh, and this is the project. As I said, the, the, the entire site was about 15 acres, or almost 16 acres, 15 and 3 quarters, and the area that we're working on, excuse me, is roughly about 2 acres. And we have a little stream coming in here. This is where we want to be doing the, the stream restoration. We have the, the wetland is a roughly about a half an acre of wetland and about an acre and a half of lowland meadow. We also have a little uh, walking path that's part of this uh, uh, project. And that just, uh, that'll uh, overlook the, the meadow and the, uh, uh, the, the wetland area here. And this is the roadway right in through here. And I said, uh, the, uh, right now, it's, it's nothing but, or before we did this, it was nothing but Phragmites. It was a monoculture of invasive plants, primarily. So you know what that means. Is that that's no biodiversity at all. I and mean, we, had, we had mosquitoes and we had deer. That's the only thing that was there. And these guys, the good, they weren't around. So you have a monoculture invasive plants, you're gonna have no ecosystem. And all these guys, they weren't, they weren't around. It was, just, it was just mosquitoes. So what our goal was, was to using native plants, <coughs> create a, an environment that will bring all these good guys back and create a, an ecosystem. I mean, they're, they're the ecosystem. You can't create one, you have to, but uh, create an environment that'll bring these guys back. So, how did we start? Well, first we had to treat the Phragmites. That was the uh, first and foremost, and it was, they were really bad. That was 95% of, the, of the, the invasive were them. And what we did, we came in in the fall of uh, 2012, in October, and we sprayed it with a Mazapir, and that is a, uh, a non-selective herbicide that's, that is uh, registered for wetland use. And we, we did that, and then our goal was, and I forgot to mention, our goal was to have everything done, all the planning pathway, everything completed by uh, the middle of May of 2013. So we came in, we, we sprayed that. In the spring, we started, we just kind of let it sit, let it fallow. We came in, we got every, all the areas staked out, and then we started with a stream restoration, which was the farthest point, finished that up, came in, did the grading and the area for the wetland and the meadow, and then moved uh, the path. Usually you put the path, uh, any hardscaping, you would do that first, but since this is the area closest thing, we were driving back and forth on it, that was the last uh, to do. So as far as the stream uh, restoration, what we had, restoration, what we had to do is we had to do a, 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 a storm uh, inlet channel and uh, regrade that so the wetlands and the, the, uh, uh, the, the stream would be connected a little bit. Riprap, the usual suspects. Anytime you do uh, stream restoration, you use uh, riprap. Uh, and uh, root wads is the first time I ever really was involved with them. I never, I, I never worked with them. I didn't know. This was really my first project. I, to be honest, I, I, was, uh, I was in uh, commercial landscaping pretty much my whole life. And so I always wanted to do a wetland project. And it was really my first time to really get involved with this. So it was pretty exciting. And the root rods were one of them. I didn't, uh, didn't know too much about it. I did some research. Stroud has a lot of information on it. And they're a big advocate of, of using them, just basically taking the branches and the, from the thing and stuffing them in the, uh, uh, the stream and uh, the fish and apparently really, really enjoy it. And then we did some live stakes, which are basically about two and a half foot uh, dormant uh, twigs, or they were about a half an inch uh, in caliber, and of wetland plants, and you plant them in the riprap, 
and along the, uh, the stream bank to uh, stabilize the soil, uh, keep uh, from erosion. And it also takes away that, that harshness that, uh, uh, of, uh, of riprap. It gives, uh, once the, the top, they, they fill in and uh, you get some green there, it uh, creates a little habitat and it takes away that harsh look of uh, just having riprap there. So the first thing, this is one of the streams. You can see there was, uh, there was a lot of, lot of erosion there and we, we put the riprap in and did some grading, backbladed it a little bit, put that in. And then, uh, by the way, everything, all these, if you have any uh, interest or whatever, I did, I did leave a page uh, of all my resources and everything where you can look these up. They really have some great rep websites and things to look at. So, and what we did, the root wads, uh, what, with the area where we put the path, we didn't take any desirable trees, or, but we did take, there were some that were already down. And can you see all right there? Some that are already down, and uh, and the, the area where we we did lay out the the path, we just clean that up, and then you just put them down there by the streams, and and that's where they look. And then they kind of the I guess the fish, whatever they get down there, and they love it. I talked to a couple of the fishermen. Uh, we walked the dog along Valley Creek in uh, uh, Valley Forge Park. And there's a lot of fly fishermen and everything. They love these, these type of things. So that's it. And you see some skunk cabbage coming up there. Okay, the next thing we did the, the live stakes. And I really wanted to have a little more diversity here. But we only, these were specked out. But I wanted to use some Ilex verticillata, some winterberry, some uh, viburnum dentatum. But uh, Ernst, uh, the, the only ones they had at the time were, were these. And they're all natives. They were, so, that, so that's what we used. And we put them on about three foot centers, about uh, six that we used about uh, roughly 650, 700 of them. And that's, this is from Ernst. By the way, if you ever, uh, Ernst catalog is a great resource. If anybody that you guys want to, boy, you got all the information have on it. It really were, were helpful. We got our seed and things from them. So that's how you plant. And then the, the root system gets established and for erosion and you get some top growth. So we put all them in. And I'll go through some of these pretty quickly. I mean, it's just the guys out there planting. And you can see them right, right in along there because the, they're, they're, they're just dormant right now. So now the fun part. This is what I was looking at, the wetland grading. The wetland is, is roughly, I said, it's about half an acre. And the, the cut to the bottom of the wetland was about seven feet. And we had roughly four or 5,000 yards of soil that we had to dig out and spread out. We wanted to keep it on site. And the, the wetland meadow, or we're putting in the meadow where the old, ba uh, the old pond was, that was so undulating and everything else. So it was easy to, to spread all this and get rid of it. And this is the beginning of it. Now, getting back to what we were talking about this morning with Phragmites. And even though we sprayed these, the, the Phragmites, I was really concerned about having any, any of them just uh, survive the, the herbicide in the, uh, in the fall. And what I didn't want to do is take all that material from the wetland and spread it out uh, over an acre and a half of meadow put the meadow seed in there and have Phragmites coming up all over the place. So what we decided to do, the first foot, foot and a half, almost two feet of soil that we pulled out of, of the wetland, we took that and we pushed that up into a little area on the east side of the basin or of the, of the wetland and put it in there. So it was roughly in an area that was maybe 10, 15,000 square feet. So, and my thinking was, if we do have Phragmites, and they do, uh, they did uh, survive the, uh, uh, this, the treatment, at least we can hand manage that. Because if they were all over the thing, we never would, you couldn't spray them, you can't do it. I don't know what, I, what we were gonna do with that. So that was my goal, and hopefully it was going to work. So, and here's the, here's the final cut. Here's the, the original grade. We're down to about seven feet. 
And here's the uh, inflow channel. And you can see, uh, I don't know if you remember last April, it really started raining. And uh, we had a lot of rain and it was really wet. You can see. <laughs> this is looking west into the, the basin area now, or the, I keep saying the basin, the uh, uh, meadow area. And that's it. We uh, took it and then we just spread that out. And that's looking west. So there's the uh, final, we're pretty close, and there's the, the inlet channel, and there's the final wetland. And, and this is at the end of April, and it was really, you could hardly walk in that. I mean, you were up to your knees in mud, but we thought, ah, eh, let's give it a shot. And we had, the, uh, we had all the, the, the plugs from, uh, uh, from Aquascape, so we said, let's, let's give it a shot. We're going to do it. And the area we were talking about, uh, the area we wanted to plant, basically was around two feet up to about shoreline. So this is, this is the area. So we're looking for plants that were uh, not only adaptable, but that were uh, normally growing in that, native plants. And these are the ones we used. And I have, I'm going to show you all these in a minute, but uh, we did. And uh, a guy, Seth Bacon, who is a... He is a uh, wetland, wetland ecologist and uh, uh, consultant, and he does a lot of work with Gilmore, Gilmore and Associates, who, is, who are our uh, township uh, engineer. And uh, he was really a great guy to work with. He specced all these plants out and everything, and uh, really did a good job. So this is what we, uh, and these are the ones we used for the plugs, for the thing. So you got Nymphia odorata, we have uh, white water lily, and this, uh, this right here, th that's where the, the, the uh, uh, depth of water that they would be, they're most adaptable. So we have that for one to three feet. Uh, uh, pickleweed, uh, uh, P Pontetaria uh, cordata, and that, that, was, uh, that was just a great plant. Uh, Sagittaria latifolia, the arrowhead, and that's from zero up to about a foot of, Spargenium uh, uricarpum, uh, burrweed, and these are all native plants. Uh, Serpus tabernae montanae. Um, again, now a lot of time I, you know, I don't want to get into the thing, but in Ann Rhodes's book and Tim Block's book, Aquatic Plants of Pennsylvania, they call this the, the genus rather than Serpus, they call it a uh, uh, Chinoplectus uh, tabernae montanae, but it's the same plant. So I, uh, but. My Bible's right here, uh, Gleason Cronquest, and that's what the, uh, and the uh, button bush, the Cephalanthus oxynatalis. This was the only woody of the plant. All the other ones were herbaceous, and this is a woody plant. Uh, uh, oh, I wanted to show you, most of them were plugs. We planted them plugs. The Sagittaria and the Nymphia were, were actually uh, rooted cuttings. And I just, I just put them on there. They're, actually, I guess there's uh, Stoloniferous, and uh, you just uh, a big bag of, uh, of roots and things. But the other ones were just were plugs. And I said, you know, we planted these about three, about two to three foot centers. And uh, this is also from Aquascape. So they, this is where we got all our, our plugs and everything. They have a great website as well. And. Again, I, you know, I was always, I've never done anything with wetlands, but you do uh, a planning for uh, uh, on a, uh, just like a, an office building or whatever, whatever, you can lay it out and lay it out and, you know, look at it, ah, just tweak it, a, tweak it a little bit or do it something. You can't do that with a wetland. You're in the water and everything. So I did, I, I really, I, I tried to find, you know, how the, the natural association of the plants were to each other and everything. Tried to lay them out there and that, just kind of sketch this up and that's what we, that's what we went, with, went by. And here we are, getting dirty and having fun. And we did get muddy. See so them put them in. And you can see how deep they were. They were up through their up to their knees in, in muck. Which, which one are you then? I'm taking the picture. <laughs> I, did, I did get stuck in there. Yeah. yeah. I actually, I, I did get stuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and the, one thing I want to point out, look at the color of the water here now. 
And just keep it, you know, going down the road. Um, okay, we finished up the, uh, the wetland and then we went to the meadow. And uh, again, earned seed, they were great. Uh, uh, Seth had specked out some uh, seed mixes for this and they were so close, they already had their, their mixes already made up. There's just a couple that we, uh, that we did a custom mix on, but, uh, but they were great, but they have their, uh, and it's a, it's a great resource. I don't, I don't wanna go through the whole list of what was in that, but they're all, these are all native plants and they were, they were really good. The cover crop, we had talked about this this morning, but one, the cover crop they used, uh, we, they were specked out, <coughs> specked out was red top which is a, a grostis, which is a, a bent grass. And it's not a native. And we do, in Schuylkill Township, we put in, we have a native plant ordinance we put in in 2009. And I didn't want to taint that in any way. And red top is a great plant, it's a great cover plant. You use it in projects like this all the time, but it's not native. It's a naturalized uh, 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 a seed. Red top is, I, I don't know, it is a bent grass, so it's in the uh, agrostis uh, uh, genus. Is, is it as tall as like a corn grass? It is, I mean, you get it, it but it, it's also, bent grasses, they, they do, they're a little rhizominous too, mm -hmm. uh, but they're, they're good, they can hold, they're good for erosion control. Yeah. And, uh, but again, it was, they've been here, they've been over here a long time, but they're not native, so. So anyhow, I, I tried to find, and like we talked, I, I got some nice cool season grasses uh, that were native, uh, Riverbank and Virginia Wild Ride, and that's what we used for the native. That was the only change I made on the... Uh, uh, annuals. Excuse me? Are they annuals? No, no, they're perennial. They're perennial. They're perennial. Yeah. But they're, well, they're much faster established than a lot yeah. of the other Is that a warm season, cool season yeah. grasses. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I've used um, oats. Yes. And oats was another one, and there are, but I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to keep an all, so this is just because of the, the, the wet area, yeah, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we end up using, so. And what we did, I mean, I had, uh, we didn't have any uh, spreader you were talking about this morning, and I just had little cyclone spreaders and things, and the, the seed, uh, some of this uh, wildflower seed, it's fluffy, it is, and it really, uh, we weren't on the cyclone spreader, you couldn't get a real good I was afraid it was going to be too spotty and everything. So this is Nick. Nick is the uh, the roadmaster. He and I seeded all this. And what we did, we just took uh, we just took buckets uh, and we uh, put the the seed in uh, and we marked off little with our, our little um, um, markers, you know, 50 by 50 feet, and we just were like feeding the chickens. He went in one direction and I crisscross went in the other, and we got really good just to get uniform coverage and that's how we that's how we put it in you can mix the seed with uh like with sand or, or stuff yeah there, there's some other things i didn't want to get in i mean you didn't have uh, i just wanted to get it done <laughs> and, right, right. and this uh so yeah and we did we we did mulch all this with hydro mulch oh. and and the kind of he wanted to he wanted to put it i said no i'm not going to put it in the thing because theoretically what would happen you you put it in with the mulch it's not going to all make soil contact. It's going to germinate in, in the mulch. And, uh, but we ended up uh, using just a, a straw mulch rather than uh, yeah. a straw or whatever, and we did that. So, but, but we did it, and uh, we got everything in, and that's how we, uh, there are our flags there we did. So we got that. The last thing to do, we put in the path, and that was about a six foot wide paved path. And we'll, Probably down the road, we're going to extend this when we do something with the rest of the, uh, the site down to the historical areas. And it does overlook the wetland and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, meadow there. So, everything was done. We, we made it. We got, got everything done by the middle of May. And then I was concerned, okay, how's this stuff going to, going to do? Because I gotta tell you, we didn't, we, you, you dig a hole, you put the plant in, you backfill it. This was like working in soup. We would just put it in there, and I, I said, how? And I kept talking to John over at Aquascapes. He said, don't worry, it'll be fine, it'll be fine. But I, there was nothing, it was just, you know, it, and I was worried if we start, we were getting all this rain, they would just start washing some of the plants away. But, uh, but he said, don't worry. So, so we went down, this is about three weeks later, 
we finished the we finished the planning the first week of May. And uh, there it goes. Um, we went down and it, yeah, it started. It was growing, so at least it didn't wasn't moving. <laughs> so we went back in in June, take pictures, and you see the, the bulrush here and the uh, spurgeonium is here, uh, the pickerel weed. Uh, so it, it was really uh, and the lilies and stuff. They uh, so uh, so it was doing. Remember, I said when we took that initial. Uh, grading and we pushed it up on the hill because I, I didn't want Phragmites coming all over the place Well, you can start seeing some of the some of these things they did survive and they were growing on the on that slope there's not a few a few of them here not a lot but uh, here they are here you can see more the, the, the meadow, I mean, it was a little wispy. They're primarily warm season grasses, and my, so I wasn't worried about they weren't going to germinate this quickly. And also, if you remember, uh, last, last summer, until the middle of summer, it was, we had pretty cool nights. So, uh, so the, the, the soil was warming up and everything, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to uh, germinate that quickly. So I wasn't worried about that. You can see that. You see how wet. There's a lot of moisture in the ground. You got some little wispies coming up. Here and there, there's, I think I have a close-up. Uh, there's a couple, there's wild senna right there. And there's some uh, rebecca, not too many. There's panicum, switch uh, grass was in there. You don't, didn't see too much of that coming up just yet. So the live stakes and the riprap, they look good. They were all, they all leafed out. And it looks like they were going to, uh, uh, you know, they were, all survived. So uh, in the middle of July, we went out and looked, and it really began. It was starting to look like a wetland. Now we started. We're getting some really hot weather. I don't know if you remember July, but we around the Fourth of July, it really got hot. But things were, you know, it was, uh, yeah, I was feeling pretty good about it. Excuse me. There's a pickle weed, and it, uh, that's just a great plant that was blooming all through, right through till frost. So how deep was it? The, uh, the, I would say it was probably rough. I didn't go down in there, cause it, but I would say it was probably about a foot and a half, two feet around there. There are some Phragmites coming up. Did you dig it out? Uh, we, we did some of them, not, not a lot, not a lot. We have to, uh, we need volunteers to do a lot more. But, and there's the, uh, The meadow was really starting to perk up, and uh, see, there's some Rebecca blooming, and uh, didn't really grow too much, but it, it was it was getting there. It was getting, uh, and I didn't see too many invasives in here. I didn't see any Phragmites out in the in the meadow. Because the initial grade, I, I'm hoping because that initial grading we pushed. Most of that, because most of that, the root development, the, the Phragmites are stolen if they'll, they'll send, and you get maybe uh, the first foot and a half or two feet of soil, hopefully you take care of most of it. And we took anything, anything that came from the original cut, we pushed to this top of this hill. That's what I'm gonna do. So if they came up there, if we had to lose anything to go in and spray it, yeah. we, you know, that's, you know, that's the area we would do. The one thing, what mile a minute, it just went crazy last year. And I worked down at the Tyler Arboretum, so I knew, I, I should have known, but it just, it took over. It took over on the riprap, and you, it's the perfect name for that because it was, it just swallowed up all our live stakes. All our, you couldn't see them anymore. It was just nothing but mile a minute. So we've had good control of mile a minute, just cutting it to keep it from... Yeah, if you, if you get it... Uh, and that was that's the problem, you know. I just you know this. I'm, I was doing it a volunteer, and I, you couldn't get there like you know a couple times a week. If you could do it on a weekly and do it, you would probably. But I was here like every three weeks or so, and we really and that's one of the things we have to do is get some volunteers in there to really, you know, to help with it, things like that. We've gotten rid of. We've almost gotten rid of it in our yard. Just Good. Like cutting oh, it. Yeah. You know, 
Yeah. And keeping yeah. it from going to seed. Yeah. So. And here, I, I just call that, that's my, uh, that's uh, Phragmites berm there. That's uh, we pushed everything up into there. We have a lot of, there is a lot of the wild rye coming up, but, but it, it, it's small, it's a, a small enough area that we can probably, you know, maintain, just go in and we'll probably weed whack things, weed whack it back and try to get it, um, get it under control. And this is in August. And you can see there's, this is some nut sedge coming up in here. That's pretty, uh, that's a scourge of uh, turf man grounds managers, but they, uh, it's a pretty good indicator of uh, a lot of moist, moist soil, wet soil. It was still, still too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it was fine there. It didn't hurt anything. And there's the, uh, again, there's, see some Phragmites, but you can see the, uh, the meadow is really, really started to uh, perk up, really look good. Now, getting back to what we're, my, I, I think it, you know, does everybody know the uh, apical, apical dominance, where uh, the, uh, a plant just wants to grow up, and that, that apical meristem is really, is going to, it's going to grow, because it wants to grow up into, into the light and photosynthesize. And generally, when you nip that, then that, uh, that releases and you get some lateral growth and everything. Generally, you do that with, with any plant, grass, you pinch back your flowers, uh, any, any kind of uh, tree, anything will, will do that. It, it just wants to grow up. And I, I thought about doing this here, but we're getting into the end of August, and the, I wasn't uh, real comfortable with the equipment that the... Uh, uh, the roads crew has because it's all it was all cut the turf about three or four inches i only wanted to take maybe the seed heads off and things like that and and so my my thought was you know what we're not going to cut it we're just going to let it let it grow it's it's going to photosynthesize and the energy sink is is t uh, for the top growth at this time of the year and then by september october when it stops growing it's going to the It'll start sending that, that food, that photosynthate, down to the, uh, down to the root system, and, and that's what I wanted. We, they do have a flail mower. This was, there's no way I wanted to put this with a flail mower. They didn't even have a root system yet or rip all the, the plants right out of the ground. So, so I just opt to not cut anything at all and wait. I told the, the crew, I said, we'll just wait until uh, we get a good frost, everything goes dormant, and brown, it stopped photosynthesizing, then we'll just we'll go in and cut it back. And that's, that's, what we, uh, uh, that's what we did. So, lessons learned. Um, site preparation, I, I would have liked to have gone in and treated the Phragmites a year in advance to get it under control and maybe just come back six months later or whatever and spot spray what was there. Because, and we talked about, you know, we thought about what you were saying this morning with the, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe not even put wildflowers in the original thing, just have grasses, but the biggest problem was Phragmites, which is a monocot. You can't, you wouldn't be able to spray that because uh, a broadleaf uh, herbicide isn't going to do that. It, it, anything that's going to kill that is going to kill the grass also. So, so I was, uh, that's why we said, okay, we'll just push this up and get it, you know, get it, uh, maintain it that way. Also about the, uh, well, I'll just go down. Uh, uh, the root wads, I mean, it, it's a great uh, uh, habitat for aquatic, uh, for fish and turtle, things like that. I've never, it's the first time I ever really was involved with it. It should more often for the mile minute, just get in there and get it cleaned up. And uh, getting back to the Phragmites, which I started up here, we were down, um, I gave a little workshop to a group of uh, volunteers from the Heinz Wildlife Refuge down at Tinnegan Marsh, down by the airport uh, last spring. And they invited us down, my wife Kate and I, we went, we went down to, uh, uh, to visit it. It was really neat, because every time you go to the airport, it's, oh, one of these days I have to get down here and see this. But we, we finally got down. And uh, what they do, because they always have a big Phragmites problem, they can't do any spraying as, as uh, volunteers, but they go in and they just, they weed whack it down three or four times a year they, before it gets to, in the spring, uh, early summer. It doesn't, they don't let it get to seed, cut it down, 
And what it does, because it can't photosynthesize, it can't, it just depletes, it just uh, depletes the energy. And after a couple of years or so of doing that, it just, it takes care of it. And, uh, and then other plants, more desirable plants and whatever, they come in and they'll take over. And uh, so we're going to start doing that with here, uh, with this area, too, because I don't want to spray it. Um, because it's, you can, like we're, uh, who we're saying this morning, it may be, and I've done that before, you can cut, cut it back to maybe just a little stub and kind of spot spray or whatever. I, you know, I, it, it's a tool. I don't like to do a lot of spraying, whatever, but sometimes that, that might be the best uh, alternative with some things. If you cut it back and then let it regrow and then spray it, then the spray is more effective. Something it, like it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do that, and um, and with a mowing schedule, we talked about that before. You know, I just uh, I just opt to. Uh, I didn't want to cut it down and scalp it too far, and then just you know lose them. So I just uh, just opt out on that. The wetland plant establishment. I was uh, I really was I was shocked. I the first time I ever worked with wetland plants and did it, and they really they they did a great job the first year. You really got a lot of bang for your buck with them. And uh, they really look good. Remember, I was saying about the the color of the water, and this isn't the best picture. But right before we plant it, and this is in in April, the water had kind of a greenish, almost algae look to it. After these plants got developed uh, a root system, they're growing. It was never like that again. It was it was always actually even clear down to about that much. And I, you know, I know that there's bacteria. I mean, that's the whole point of wetlands. They do, uh, they're like natural, natural filters, but it was a really good uh, illustration of, uh, and that wasn't the bad, I was trying to find one that was really, because it was green. And then the other ones, were, they were clear. Uh, it was, uh, I, I was, uh, and they work for free. You don't have to do anything. It was, it was great. Oh, and I was gonna say, this goes, if you build it, they will come. I got I to gotta tell you, when we, in the middle of summer, we went down there, this place, it was bustling with activity. I mean, we had, there were frogs and toads and dragonflies and butterflies and birds. Every time we went down there, there was this blue heron. And I couldn't get close enough because my camera was just a little, but I, he, was al he was always there. He was always there. So, uh, so he went from a mosquito-infested <laughs> Thing to and it it really was it was amazing so it really is beginning to uh, you know uh, become an ecosystem so going from here out uh, we did because uh, this is a township this is part of our open space is a township uh, uh, property and we're trying to do something going forward like a little park whatever we uh, had set up a steering committee with uh, different representatives from all the uh, uh, councils and the and I I was the EAC rep, and we had uh, Gilmore and Associates, their landscape Chris Green who is their uh, landscape architect really did a, really did a great job, and he was taking in everybody's recommendation and whatever, and we came up with a kind of a conceptual design uh, that everybody seemed to be happy with. This is the area we're um, we worked on down in here, and this is the rest of it and. The, um, we, we sent out flyers to the township residents and we had a, a meeting, it was right before the holidays in uh, November, and we had a really good turnout. Everybody got, got a lot of feedback from the residents. They were very happy with it. And uh, so we'll see, now we need some grant money to, <laughs> to move forward with that. The last thing that we did on, on the site was we had, we were required to put in the uh, a sign from DCNR. The the grant. Yes. Time. And uh, what I'll do, I'll, I'll let uh, Drew tell you about some of the funding we use for this site and what be similar sites. And here is my, real quick, there is my uh, thing. I do have, uh, I made some sheets if you're interested. These, these are really some great websites and things for, uh, for wetlands. Thanks. So, so that's it. Uh, my name is Drew Gilchrist. I am the regional advisor for the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Uh, what, one of the great things about my job is I get to help communities and nonprofits fund their conservation and recreation goals. Uh, so my, my particular department, my bureau uh, within the, the Bureau 
is it called the Bureau of Recreation and Conservation. So Rec and Con is sort of a subset, another bureau like Bureau of Forestry, Bureau of State Parks, Topo Geo, are smaller bureaus within that greater Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. One of the, our primary jobs is providing technical advice and uh, grant monies to do projects like Jerry was talking about today. So our grant program, and it's the first one on the list here, um, is called the Community Conservation Partnership Program, or C2P2. And that provides funding for land acquisition for, for natural areas, acquisition for recreational lands. Uh, it will provide planning work for master site plans for uh, parks, uh, for recreation areas, uh, feasibility studies for things like pools. Uh, we also do a lot of trail building. A lot, we heard today William Penn talking about the circuit. We spend a lot of money every year helping to build the circuit around the, uh, the, trail, the major trails around the uh, Bucks, Montgomery, Philadelphia, and Delaware County area. Uh, my territory is in sort of the southeastern part of the state. So myself and another gentleman, Jeff Knowles, have Philadelphia, Delaware County, Chester, Bucks, and Montgomery. There are similar people to such as myself in the south central part of the state and the northeast. So if you're from Schuylkill County or from Berks County, uh, there's a regional representative up there that would take care of your needs. Uh, our program uh, funds projects Really, the smaller projects are like twenty, thirty thousand dollars, going up to about two hundred fifty thousand dollars in money that we would put out. And ours is a match program, so our program would be that you would come in and say the project's worth one hundred thousand dollars. So you would may apply to our program for about 50 percent of the money or half the money. So um, I'm not sure what the, the budget was for your particular project here, but again, we would provide about half the funding. Now uh, we encourage. Uh, folks who are using our money to partner with other groups. So watershed associations, um, Kiwanis clubs, folks who can bring some money or in-kind services to the table. Now that match can be in-kind or it can be just ca you know, cash. Now, cash is always a very fine thing to have in your hands to be able to match our program for. But we do um, encourage partnerships. One of the other things we do in our parks is we're really encouraging uh, the green and sustainable park. So this valley park was really, really right up our wheelhouse. Uh, you know, they were installing wetlands, they were putting native plant meadows, they were installing native landscaping, they were doing interpretation, they were using a trail to connect people to nature. Boy, it just hit on all of our buttons. So it really was a good match for our program money. So if you're thinking about things like stream bank restoration, if you're thinking about putting, uh, changing your, your uh, basins the naturalized basins. One of the programs you should consider is this uh, community conservation partnership program. Now I will tell you if you are looking for funding for a program, it's a good idea to call the regional advisor in your area. And I have it on the sheet here, uh, different regional advisors for different counties. Uh, I have found, I've only been with this organization for about a year and a half now, but when I went to the last grant round, the people who talked to regional advisors definitely scored better. And our program, it's all about getting a good score on the application. We have a 100 point program, the higher your score, the better chance you have of being funded because we start funding the stuff that scores the best and we go down the list till we run out of money. Uh, another place to think about funding, and I, what, what I'm doing here is sort of sh giving the overview from the state level and I'll try to work down to the regional level, was a program that came through Act 13, the impact fee on the Marcellus Shale. That program is run by the uh, Department of Community and Economic Development for the Greenways, Trails, and Recreation Program. You may not have heard about this program because last year was the first year for this money. Uh, this program will also fund things like watershed restoration programs, implementations of river conservation plans, as well as traditional conservation and recreation types of things. Uh, many of the applicants to our program, I tell them, double down. If you're gonna apply for our program, this one's a little bit later in the year. The requirements are much the same why not apply for both of them? You've already done most of the work already. Apply for this program too. We talk to each other. We'll actually do actually do a little reviews between the different programs. So we'll know if you're getting funding from them and they'll know if you're getting funding from us. And um, we won't we'll probably both give you funding for the same project, but um, it allows the money to go further to somebody else if, if you're getting funding through their program. So the, the guidelines for this program are not out yet, but one of the nice things about this program is there's a much lower match threshold. It may be 20%, maybe 30%. I know they're going to change this year. So um, 
it's not as much money to, there's not as much money available, but there it is another great source of money. I will also tell you that program, if you're going to apply for it, make sure you include your local legislator, either your state senator or your um, uh, state representative, because that particular program the, is decided on the four caucuses of the Democratic and Republican parties in both the House and the Senate and members of the governor's office. So there's more of a political bent to that program than there is ours. I like to think ours is really quite meritorious. Which, but which it's called the Greenways, Trails, and Recreation Program. It's the bottom of page one. Okay. Sorry, I didn't get my numerals straight there. Um, but again, it's only been around for a year or so. It's not as quite much money this year as it was last year, but I think they're spending probably about six to eight million dollars on recreation programs. But that's definitely one you want to connect with your local legislator. Uh, again, the, the program requirements is up to $250,000, and the grant deadline will be around either early to late summer. But make sure you give them a call and talk to a regional advisor for that program, too. Another program with the state that focuses a lot on stormwater and restoration projects, especially related to streams and wetlands, is the Department of Environmental Protection's Growing Greener Watershed Protection Grants. Uh, the, there's not quite as much money available there. Most grants are less than $100,000, but it only requires a 15% match. So uh, it, again, if, you wanna, if you're in this area, in the southeast, Dave Burke in Norristown is your contact, and I have his contact information there. Uh, but it is a great program for stormwater management, wetlands, repair and buffer plantings, agricultural BMPs, and watershed-based conservation projects. If you're doing really large projects, number C, one that's listed here is number C, is the PENVEST. PENVEST is focused in most communities <coughs> on helping with the wastewater treatment uh, program. There's a lot of money available in that program, and only a portion of it is devoted towards stormwater mitigation and improvement of, of, of some non-point point solutions. Uh, but if you, I would suggest you call to, Tess, Tess Rush Schlupp, who is out of uh, the Harrisburg area, who has this area. Her contact information is there. Um, if, if you're in the northern regions, if you're in Berks County, except in points north in Lehigh and, and northeast PA, a woman named Rebecca Kennedy, some of you might know her, she used to be a worship specialist up at the Lehigh Conservation District, is running that program. They're trying to make that program a little bit more friendly for uh, conservation projects. Uh, it's, with its heavy bent on engineering for wastewater treatment, the application can be very, very difficult and cumbersome. But they are trying to make it much more, e much e more easy to do some uh, programs for the uh, stormwater, uh, uh, stormwater restoration. Also through the state is a program called Tree Vitalize. And if you've been in a community with, that has been planted trees, you more than likely have dealt with the Tree Vitalize program. In the southeast, the program is administrated through the local conservation district. So if you're in Chester County, you contact Chester County Conservation District, Montgomery County, the same. If you're outside of Southeastern PA, it's best to call Christine Ticehurst, who's the program administrator. She'll be able to set you up with a uh, application. They do two grant rounds a year. Um, they, they require 25% match of which it can be all in kind. Maybe it's your, your township people who are making application for this program. But it's a great way to get trees planted both in street tree form as well as restoration projects and parks projects. On a more regional basis in the area in the southeast, uh, there, is, there is the REN grants. Uh, Julie Kolar, who is attending this, meet, this session, has Water Resource Education Network grants uh, through the League of Women Voters. Those grants are about $5,000 and require a 15% match. They will allow up to $7,000 for source water protection. Uh, they have a, their, their deadline this year is coming up on March 21st, but uh, if you start thinking about it for next year, it's a good source of local money uh, for, for this program. It is a little cumbersome for the $5,000 you do get, but you know, a lot of these pro projects are, are, have a difficult time finding the match. If your community doesn't have the cash available or is not providing in-kind matches, this is a good source of income for this. Uh, the last couple that I have here on this situation uh, are sort of di uh, different scales. Uh, the next one is the R Schuylkill River Restoration Fund restoration grants. Uh, there was some money that came from Exelon for the interbasin transfer of water for the nuclear power plant in Limerick. Uh, 
they are no longer required to, to make this contribution anymore, but they like the program so much, they have uh, continued the program in conjunction with the Schuylkill River Heritage Area. So grants for this program can be between two, 20 and $100,000. They require a 25% match. Uh, and there's also some money available for land transaction assistance. So if you're a land trust or a township that has costs associated with acquiring a piece of open space, maybe for boundary surveys, for appraisals, you can get about $4,000 in assistance from this program. Uh, Tim Fenchel, the Schuylkill River Heritage, runs that program, and he's and there's inf and the uh, website is also listed here for what kind of things are going on there. I did not put a grant deadline, but I believe it's a, a program that's open now and will close sometime in May. The last couple of grants that are available here are much smaller, smaller grants. Uh, the first one I have listed is the Pico Green Regions Grant. Pico uh, has a program that will provide up to about ten thousand dollars to different. I think they provide it's either a hundred thousand or fifty thousand dollars for a pot. Uh, local community representatives decide which which submissions are good. Uh, they have two grant rounds a year, both in the fall and the spring. Um, there is a fifty percent match, and you have to put the money up front and get reimbursed later on. But up to ten thousand dollars can be an important thing for a project that, like this we were talking about here uh, with Valley Park. Natural Lands Trust administers the program for that, so I've listed the contact information for a woman named Holly Harper, who's a lovely friend of mine. Uh, she's a terrific lady, and she'll be able to tell you more information about the Pico Green Regions Grant and when the grant deadlines are. The last one on, on page five that I have listed here is called the Schuylkill Highlands Conservation Landscape Mini Grant Program. DCNR has designated conservation landscapes throughout the, the state. In this area, it's called the Schuylkill Highlands. Up north in the great big woods, it's called the PA Wilds. There's one at the Poconos, there's one at South Mountain. There's one out in the Lehigh area. These are areas, much like we heard today from William Penn, that are areas that we've identified as being important, that we are, act are actually putting additional monies into. Uh, you, the projects coming out of those areas um, get uh, additional points on, a, on our grant applications. But also within the conservation landscape, they run a mini grant program. And the program is, again, run through the Natural Lands Trust. And I have listed here the regional contact, a woman named Carol DeWolf, who is our landscape coordinator. Um, you can see what the pro program fundings there are. So you can go to this, the website to see if your township or your, your municipality is in the Schuylkill Highlands. We are in it right now in Pottstown. It goes up north as far as Reading. It includes much of the, if you think about where the, the big forests are out in uh, Chester County, in Berks County, in the Ole Valley through there, out into the Anami Forest out in northern Montgomery County, and a little further north up to Lake Nockamixon is sort of where the Schuylkill Highlands is. It's a funky, um, a funky outline, so you have to really go to the website, look on the map that there is at the website, and see if your township qualifies. But those grants are going to be um, open here within on, um, in later March. And the grant deadline for them is uh, May 9th, 2014. And they're looking to fund projects that match up the priorities of the conservation landscape. Uh, finally, the last thing listed here is on our website at DCNR, there is sort of an e-library of great funding opportunities that are more, or, or more widespread than what I have listed here. The ones I try to focus on this way are ones that I know of that you can use to either match our program or that can fund a lot of the types of projects we find in this area. So, and I went through that pretty quickly, but I figure you have everything written down and you guys can read, obviously. Um, and I know that I'm also standing between you and getting out of here. So, <laughs> I wanted to keep it brief, uh, but uh, those are some opportunities. Uh, the program that I run, the C2 P2 <coughs> program, um, is open until April 16th. That's the program that funded the Valley Project. And uh, we were just tickled with the results. Uh, Jerry and his crew and the township did a wonderful job. They had great partners. Uh, it's a real safe community in Schuylkill Township, and we were really proud to be part of that. So I thank you for your time.